years ago, the earth shook Haiti right off of its foundations. A magnitude seven earthquake struck just before five o'clock in the evening on January the 12th. And there were 52 aftershocks greater than 4.5 over the next two, two weeks. Homes and businesses and schools, the land, air, air and sea transportation systems and facilities, the electrical network, the communication systems were all shook and rattled and they fell down into a great pile of rubble. The Haitian government estimates that 300,000 people died. And the, human, the, human, um, the humanitarian agencies that work in Haiti say that 7,000 more people died as a result of the cholera epidemic that followed. Today, two years later, there's as possibly as many as a million people still displaced. Suffering like this, it breaks our hearts. It, it makes us ask, why? God, why? What has happened? Is this some kind of punishment for sin? Is this God's will? And if these really horrible things can happen to innocent people, how can I continue to believe in a God that would let that happen? Generally, our, question, our questions like this come from um, two major assumptions that we make about how God works in the world. First of all, many of us say, if I believe in God and I try to be a good person, then God will take care of me and nothing bad will happen to me. Holding this kind of assumption leads us to think that evil is a result of not enough faith, or sin that's being punished, or that there is no God. Now, I'm not sure where we got this kind of assumption from, because it's not from the Bible. The Bible is story after story after story about people who, when they suffered, turned to God in their suffering. Think about Joseph and his multicolored dream coat and how he was sold into slavery in Egypt. Think about Moses who led the people out of slavery in Egypt. And all the time he's leading, he gets so frustrated, he prays to God that God will kill him and relieve him of this duty. And Moses never gets to live in the promised land. Think about all the complaint psalms, many written by David when he was being persecuted and Saul was trying to kill him. Think about the whole book of Job, Job, one really long poem about the suffering of a righteous man. And the central story of our New Testament is about a good man, a sinless man who is beaten and nailed to a cross. Several of the epistles were written by Paul from prison. The Bible is about people who turned towards God in their suffering and found hope <coughs> and comfort and the strength to continue on. Assumption number two. God's, the suffering is part of God's plan. Everything happens for a reason, so there is purpose for our suffering. Following this logic means that God planned the tragedy especially for you. God wills bad things to happen to us. God is the author of evil. Really? You're, you're saying that 196 homicides in the city of Baltimore alone were caused by God, that God pushed murder into the hearts of those killers? And if so, if that's true, then why do we lock up people for doing God's will? This can't be right. This just isn't right. God is just and loving. God does not make murderers kill. God does not send earthquakes to destroy entire regions or countries. 
So let's start afresh. Let's put aside those assumptions and start with three foundational ideas instead. Number one, gods have been given dominion over the earth. We have a responsible role in what happens here. We learn this from 1 Genesis, verses 27 to 28, that Jean so capably read. Let me refresh your memory. God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. He blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing on the earth. He has given us responsibility but God also gave us the caretaking tools to fulfill that responsibility. Firstly, God set in motion all the natural laws that govern our planet. There, there's some predictability in that. Our scientists use intellect and reason to map out those laws, to understand the processes. And then we've been given scripture and tradition to guide us. And God even gave us Jesus as an example to teach us and to show us what sacrificial love looked like. All this means that our primary way of God working in our world is through people, through our dominion as humans. When God wanted to rescue the Israelites from Egypt, he sent Moses. When Jesus wanted to spread the gospel throughout the world, he sent the apostles. When God wanted to ease suffering in Haiti, he called people from all over the world to bring food and water and shelter and medicine. The Holy Spirit motivates and empowers people to do God's work. Second foundational idea. Humans have been given free will by God. We have been made in God's image with the ability to choose good from evil. We are not God's puppets. We are free. That means we are free to love or free to turn away from love. A third foundational idea, humans struggle with that freedom. Although we have the ability to choose right from wrong, we often make poor choices. The story of Adam and Eve kind of resonates with me, particularly since it's about food. God puts Adam and Eve in the garden to till and look after it. And he just says one restriction, don't eat from the tree that has the knowledge of good and evil. But the serpent whispers, and the people rationalize sin, and they eat the fruit. They blow their diet right at the beginning of time. And they're barred from that tree of life and sent out into the greater garden to till and keep the rest of the world. They are still free, but they are living with the consequences of their decisions. Rabbi Kushner reminds us that our being free leaves us free to hurt each other. And God can't stop us from doing that without taking away our freedom, which makes us human. So the, super, the serpent whispers, and we go after money and power and sex. And the serpent whispers, and marriages fall apart. The serpent whispers, and a dictator like Hitler abuses people. The serpent whispers, and everyone else turns a blind eye and ignores that abuse. Our freedom was intended for us as a gift, but misusing it leads to suffering. So, now, holding on to those three foundational ideas that God gave humans responsibility, <coughs> that humans have free will, and that we have a tendency to miss the mark with our choices, let us now go and look at three areas of suffering. First, natural disasters. Some people would say that the earthquake in Haiti, they would call that an act of God, a punishment for the sin in Haiti. But we know, we know that the movement of the earth's plates 
are just part of the process that keeps the core of the earth from overheating, from superheating. Natural forces are essential to the life of our planet, but disastrous when humans' lives get in the way. We've been given dominion over the earth. Then our task is to adapt to those natural laws by engineering buildings that can withstand shaking, or by not living there in the, on the, where the plates meet at all. The devastation of natural disasters, though, increases. It's magnified <coughs> because of the unjust distribution of wealth in our world. Haiti has always been a poor country. In fact, it's the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. And so there were no building codes, and people built their shanty towns on the edges of mountains with no good <coughs> foundations to their homes. And even before the earthquake, there was a shortage of fuel and drinkable water. So when you get something like an earthquake in unjust areas like that, where millions of people live in disparity, then you're likely to have hundreds of thousands of lives lost, not just a few thousand. Our planet has been developed in a way that we could actually grow enough food and have enough water to look after all the people in the world, but we have not managed a just distribution system yet. We have not made the wise choices about how and where the people on Earth will live and work. Second category of suffering is caused by human decisions. Our decisions and the decisions of other people around us. It is one year since Jared Loeffler purposely bought bullets for a 9mm Glock gun. He had to go to two different Walmarts to complete that task. And at 10.10, he arrived at the Safeway near in Arizona, where Congresswoman Gabrielle Gifford was holding a constituents meeting. Opening fire on her and the crowds around her resulted in devastating injuries <coughs> to 13 people and the death of six more. Firing a gun that many times is not an accident. Loeffler hated Guilford. Guilford. He thought women should not be in politics. God does not take away our freedom, and nor does God miraculously deliver us from the consequences of our actions or the actions of others. It was Loeffler's choice to kill, not God's will. But God was there. God was there embracing all of those who were dying. God was there crying with all who were in pain. The Holy Spirit was there inspiring people like Daniel Hernandez, who provided first aid to Gabby and is credited with saving her life. And God is still there a year later working with people like Susie Heilman, who was shot herself three times, and who was the woman who brought nine-year-old Christina Green to meet her congresswoman. She is now working with school children on a project called Pictures of Hope. And the children are sent out into their community to take Photographs of things that they find hopeful, of things that they show forgiveness. And then those photos are made into greeting cards, and the greeting cards are sold to support the Christina Green Foundation. The goal is to find healing by forming new pictures of hope. God works through people. Turning from God's ways can cause pain. Turning towards God can end the suffering. The last category of suffering that we're talking today is sickness. The psalmist in Psalm 131 sings, Our bodies are fiercely and wonderfully made. Now if one of our cars lasted 15 years or 
250,000 miles, we would think that was pretty cool. We would think that was a good machine. But our bodies last even longer. Our bodies are self-healing. If we get a scratch or a dent, the skin just repairs itself. Our bodies are resilient. A woman can carry an unborn child in her and be huge, and then a few months later, shrink back to, to uh, uh, her original form. However, our bodies are not indestructible. And over time, they wear out, and our bodies are susceptible to disease. Every body yields eventually to a physical death. Even throughout our life, God is urging us, calling us to take care of our bodies and use them for good. And God empowers doctors to help us fix our broken bodies. And the Holy Spirit inspires scientists to find cures to end the suffering from diseases. God works through all the people in our life to keep us physically, mentally, and spiritually well. And when our bodies are done, God is there to carry us forward into a new age called eternal life. There are no promises that good Christians won't suffer. Suffering never has the final word, though. The Israelites were set free from slavery, and David found relief from his afflictions. <coughs> and on the third day, Jesus did rise from the dead. And one day, God's justice and mercy will reign, and there will be no more tears. Two years ago, the earth shook Haiti off its foundation. And God is still sending people to help rebuild. The United Methodists Committee on Relief that we know as UMCOR has worked there to build homes with three other agencies. And many, many people have transitional or progressive housing, permanent housing. Microcredit program has been set up to help businesses rebuild. And volunteers like Beth Ann are working with local groups to restore schools and hospitals. God's power is God's love. And God's love works through God's people, us. And love always wins in the end. Amen. Amen.